الحمد لله الحمد لله خالق الوجود من العدم وجاعل النور من الظلم ومخرج الصبر من الألم ومنقي التوبة على الندم فنشكره على المصائب كما نشكره على النعم ونصلي على رسوله الأكرم ذي الشرف الأشم والنور الأتم والكتاب المحكم وكمال النبيين والخاتم سيد ولد آدم الذي بشر به عيسى بن مريم ودعا لبعثته إبراهيم عليه السلام حين كان يرفع القواعد بيت الله المحرم فصلى الله عليه وسلم وعلى أتباعه خير الأمم الذين بارك الله بهم كافة الناس العرب منهم والعجم الحمد لله الذي أنزل على عبده الكتاب ولم يجعل له عوجا والحمد لله الذي لم يتخذ ولدا ولم يكن له شريك في الملك ولم يكن له ولي من الذل وكبره تكبيرا والحمد لله الذي نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونؤمن به ونتوكل عليه ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له ونشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له ونشهد أن محمدا عبد الله ورسوله أرسله الله تعالى بالهدى ودين الحق ليظهره على الدين كله وكفى بالله شهيدا وصلى الله عليه وسلم تسليما كثيرا كثيرا ثم أما بعد فإن أصدق الحديث كتاب الله وخير الهدي هدي محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وإن شر الأمور محدثاتها وإن كل محدثة بدعة وكل بدعة ضلالة وكل ضلالة في النار يقول سبحانه وتعالى في كتابه الكريم بعد أن أقول أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله وكونوا مع الصادقين رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحد العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي والله مجعلنا من الصادقين أمين رب العالمين Today inshallah ta'ala I want to share with you some lessons from three ayat maybe four ayat that belong to Surah At-Tawbah and a little bit of context is important for us to get some more benefit from this these few minutes that we have together Surah At-Tawbah most of it is what is revealed towards the very end of the life of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and the history of the ayat the context of these ayat are towards the end of the seerah so the last few years of the messenger alayhi salatu wasalam and a lot of this surah actually has to do with the conquest of Mecca, Fath Mecca, and the punishment that should come to the Quraysh. In other words, this struggle of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and the, and the Sahaba radiallahu ta'ala ajma'een, over two decades have gone of struggle, ups and downs. When they were in Mecca, you don't even know if they're all going to survive or not, because the, the Meccans are, or the Quraysh are an unstoppable power compared to the Muslims. They're just a handful, they don't have anything. And it's even miraculous the way they escape from Mecca. You know, if you ask a politician or, you know, even a political science expert or a military expert, these people are going to survive or not, they will say, no, there's no chance these people can survive. They're going to be executed. But they, some, somehow they survive in Medina. And even in Medina, there are all kinds of problems. It's not that there's uh, only solutions in Medina. There are its own challenges in Medina. And not even six months go by and we have to go head to head with the Meccan powers again. And the struggles continue between the Muslims and the Quraysh and also the internal challenges of Medina. And one impossible odd after another and the help of Allah keeps on coming. Until finally the most unexpected thing, actually even the entire Arabia did not expect that the Quraysh will ever be overpowered. That did not, was not expected, you know. And even that Allah gives the Muslims and they're able to overpower. Finally after all that struggle, this you can call it the superpower tribe of the region, the Quraysh. But you know what? Even from the Madani life of the Prophet ﷺ, he started sending letters to real superpowers. The Persians and the Romans, they started, people started receiving letters from the Messenger of Allah ﷺ, in an invitation to Islam. And if you just compare, within the desert of Arabia, Meccans are a big deal. Nobody wants to mess with Quraysh. Because they're the superpower. But if you put, put that in perspective of the Romans and the Persians and the, the great empires of the time, then the Meccans are nothing, they're flies. 
They have, they have no comparison to the armies of the Romans and the armies of the Persians. So for the Muslims, defeating the Meccans was a big deal. That's a huge problem for them with respect to the region. But when the conflict began and there's news that the Romans are actually gathering their armies, and to, not too soon after, we're going to find out that there's going to be even coming on the horizon conflict with the Persians, which are massive, massive armies. I mean, their armies are bigger than the population of the Muslims. Their armies alone. Not even civilians compared to civilians. There's not even a comparison. I can't even use the phrase apples and oranges because it doesn't work here. This is apples and forests of watermelons. <laughs> you know, there's no comparison. So now the Muslims feel finally they have got some victory. They were finally able to clean the house of Allah and victory came and all of a sudden a new problem is introduced. And the size of this problem is nothing like what they've ever seen before. Nothing. There's not even any comparison to any challenge they face in their entire history to this problem. And this is towards the end of the struggle. And you know when you finally win, you finally seem to feel like the problems are over, ah, you can take a breath of fresh air and say, okay, it's over now. Well, actually it's just getting started. And it's getting started in a way that the real challenge is now. SubhanAllah. SubhanAllah. And on top of this, when the news came that, you know, this massive army of the Romans is actually uniting and gathering its forces, and it's headed towards the Messenger وسلم, and the Muslims. Instead of defending the city, the instruction comes from Rasulullah let's go after them. Instead of fortifying our city where we are strongest, let's gather everyone, let's have a, a general draft of the Muslims, gather our forces and meet the enemy. Let's go meet the enemy. This is an incredible, I mean, you would even say for, at the foot soldier level, are we crazy? Is that what really we're going to do? We're going to go out and meet with them? Nobody fights with them. Nobody touches them. And they're coming after us, and we're going to go after them? This doesn't even make any sense. So there were all kinds of Muslims, right? There were the Muslims who سَبِعْنَا وَأَطَعْنَا They said, if Allah can give us victory over the Meccans, who everybody thought was impossible, what's the big deal? I don't care if they're a hundred times bigger or a thousand times bigger or a million times bigger, it doesn't matter, the help didn't come from us, the victory didn't come from us, it came from Allah, so we trust Allah and we trust His Messenger وسلم, we're going, we're going. Others said, how can we go? It's going to be really hard. And Allah made a call to the Muslims, open call, this is unlike any other battle in the past. يَا أَيُّهَا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا إِذَا قِيلَ لَكُمْ انْفِرُوا فِي سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ اتَّاقَلْتُ مِنَ الْأَرْضِ So to Tawbah again, those of you who have Iman, when you're told march forward in Allah's way, your feet get planted into the earth, what's the matter with you? مَا لَكُمْ Why aren't you moving forward? أَرَضِيْتُمْ بِالْحَيَاةِ الدُّنْيَا مِنَ الْآخِرَةِ Are you happy with this life as opposed to the next? Do you think you signed up for Islam for this life or next life? What were you thinking? You think this was going to, going to be a cakewalk and you get to celebrate in this life? This life is, the, t the test is going to continue. Get your act together. What's wrong with you? It's like a, a wake up call from Allah Azza wa in those ayat that are earlier in the surah. So when he made that call, the point I'm getting to, this is all the background, this is not the khutbah today. This is just the background so I can make a couple of points. You know, this was the time that, at which that the Sahaba had to leave and meet the enemy in battle was also harvest season. This was the only, and if you know anything about farming, harvest season does not happen every month. It happens for a few weeks, and you better pick the fruits, and crop and harvest, and pick the plants at that time. If you don't pick it at the right time, all the food will go bad. And your entire year of work will be wasted. And a lot of the farmers in Medina, they actually grew date palms, you know, palm trees. And you have to climb all the way up on top of the palm tree to pick the fruits, to pick the dates. So they can't leave the women and the children to do that, because only the men are skilled to do that. And now the Messenger is saying, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, every, every capable man has to come to fight. Can we go in two weeks? Can we just pick the fruits first? Because it's our entire year of work. No, no, you have to come right now. You have to come right now. Which Allah calls in, Quran, in, the, in this surah, لَوْ كَانَ عَرَضًا قَرِيبًا Had it been a nearby goal, just a little bit more, give us some time, let us get, some, get what we need to get, and then we'll go forward. The messenger says, no, you have to leave now. And it's the dead of the heat. Dead of the heat. So we know that the munafiqun, the hypocrites, didn't want to go ever. They didn't want to go to Badr or Uhud or Aqla. They don't want to participate in any struggle. 
But this was even a struggle that was difficult for the average believer who wasn't even a munafiq. After all, he's thinking, I'm going to go, chances are I'm going to die for the sake of Allah. But I know for a fact my family, who depends on this work, they have no food to eat after two days. If I don't pick these fruits, where their salary is not going to come from anywhere but this farm. And I have to trust Allah and I'm going. Not only am I trusting Him with my life, I'm putting my entire family's livelihood in danger as I'm going. That's what they're thinking. It's hard. It's hard. So you find some sincere Sahaba, sincere Sahaba, who said, maybe if I wait just a little bit, I have very fast horses. The Muslim army is going to leave. There are going to be lots of them and they're going to move slowly. Obviously, when thousands of people are marching, they march slowly. They don't march fast. So I have a fast horse. I can catch up with them. If I, get, if I just wait a couple of days, it's no big deal. I'll still catch up with them. But you know, one day became two days, became a week, became two weeks, and they just got left behind. They realized even if I, doesn't matter how fast I run my horse now, there's no way I'll catch up to them. So they missed out on the battle. And the embarrassment that set into them. Now there are different kinds of, everybody by the way had to present an excuse. Why didn't you go? Why didn't you go? And the munafiqun came back and gave all kinds of excuses. They said, you know, I, I didn't even know you called. You had an invitation to go? I had no idea. Nobody sent me the email. I, I, did, I didn't even check my phone, my voice note or nothing. I, really? You guys came and came back already? Mabru? You know, like they make all kinds of lame excuses. But the Sahaba, and they could have made lame excuses too. Because if you make an excuse, the Messenger والسلام, says, okay, I trust you. And he lets them go. He doesn't say, Munafiqun are lying, you're lying, that's not a correct excuse, etc. He let their excuses go, even the lamest excuses. But you know what? These Sahaba, the guilt in them was so heavy, they actually came to the Messenger وسلم, and they told the truth. They said, actually, we could have gone. We could have gone. We don't have a good excuse. And we were humiliated. We are embarrassed that we're coming and telling you this, but we cannot lie to you. Allah Azza wa Jal, after talking about those three, وَعَلَى الثَّلَاثَةِ الَّذِينَ قُلِّمُ The three that were left behind. That's the previous ayah. In the very next ayah, not only did Allah forgive them, this is the beauty of these ayah, not only did Allah forgive them, He said the ayah that I began this khutbah bit with, He said, يَا أَيُّهَا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا اتَّقُوا اللَّهِ وَكُونُوا مَعَ الصَّادِقِينَ وَهُمْ كَانُوا مَعَ الصَّادِقِينَ Allah says, those of you who have iman have taqwa of Allah. And be with the truthful. Be with the truthful. Now in the context of these ayat, the truthful ones were the ones that came to the Messenger وسلم, and were not lying about their mistake. They told the truth and they said, we're ready to make up for it. We're ready to do what it takes. If you want to punish us, we deserve it. But we want to make this up. We would rather face the problems in this life than face Allah in the Akhirah. They were truthful about that. And Allah appreciates these people instead of giving us a khutbah in the Qur'an against them. Look at them, they got left behind. Look at what they've done. You shouldn't be like them, etc, etc. Allah says, have taqwa of Allah and you should be from the truthful. In other words, even when you make a mistake, be truthful. That's a heavy lesson in the Qur'an. Because to, you know, even in your families and you know, with our children, sometimes we get very angry at our children. And children, you know, they're very smart. They're very smart. So when the parents get angry at them, the next time they make the same mistake, and the mother says, did you go there? Did you touch that? The, the child actually goes through a calculation process. If I say yes, I remember last time I got in pretty big trouble for touching it. And if I say no, maybe I'll get in trouble, maybe she'll believe me, 50-50 chance I'll get in trouble. So the truth will definitely get me in trouble, and a lie, maybe, maybe not. So I'm going to take my chances and I'm going to lie. No mother, I didn't touch it. Tell me the truth, did you touch it? No, 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 I, I swear I didn't touch it. I didn't touch it. The children are very smart, they run that calculation. <laughs> That's the same calculation every Sahabi who has to present himself before Rasulullah is going to have. If I tell him, I got lazy, I got scared, I wasn't strong enough to go to, the, to battle, to, for the fight in this, to fight in the sake of Allah, then obviously there's going to be punishments. There are going to be consequences. But if I lie to him, maybe there's consequences, maybe there's no consequences. But they know that it's not just the messenger they have to convince, sallallahu alayhi wa It is Allah azza wa they have to convince. And there's no lying that you can save from Allah. So they stick to the truth. This was actually a proof of their iman. 
And Allah loves that so much that He is telling us, anyone who makes a mistake, be honest, be truthful. Don't hide behind lies. Don't make excuses. And don't come up with creative words to justify what you did. A lot of the children upstairs that are listening, I know the school kids are listening. A lot of you, 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 don't, you say, I don't, I don't lie to my parents, and you tell yourself you don't lie. But you know what you do. You know what you really do. And Allah knows what you really do. You have to be from those who are truthful. Ya Then just the last few minutes that I have with you. I want to share with you something more beyond this. That, Wallahi, if you internalize, your view of what's happening in the world today changes. There is enough depressing news in the world today. What's happening to our families, our brothers and sisters, our fathers, our mothers, you know, our sons and daughters in Syria, what's happening to them in Egypt, what's happening to them in Burma, what's happening to them all over the, the Ummah. I mean, you, we see video footage from all over the world and it's heartbreaking, it's heart-wrenching what the Muslims are going through, what the world is going through. Right? So if you want to be depressed about the state of the world, you don't even have to keep up with the news too much. You just hear five minutes of the news and you get enough to be depressed for a year. Right? This is the state of our ummah. This is the state of the world today. But you know what? The perception from Iman is different. You see, I just told you that the Sahaba were facing a problem bigger than anything they had ever faced before. Bigger than anything they had ever faced before. And the means that they had to try to solve that problem are incomparable. There's no comparison really. They don't have the means to face the Romans. They don't. There's, there's no calculation you can make that they will be able to fight with the Romans. A soldier to 300 according to some calculations. At best 1 to 30. In worst case 1 to 300. That's ridiculous odds for one soldier. <laughs> it's, it's absurd. That's like one soldier taking on an army. SubhanAllah. But yet Allah's help came. Yet Allah's help came. We have to be a people that see all of our problems as challenges that are entirely under Allah's control. And He's only putting us through them لِيَبْلُوَكُمْ أَيُّكُمْ أَحْسَنُ عَمَلًا So He can test you which one of you rises to the occasion. Which one of you rises to the occasion. Now I set all of this for you to conclude this khutbah on this one ayah. I'm skipping an ayah because of the shortage of time. But this one ayah these people, they don't spend anything small, the believers, they don't spend anything small or anything big except, so Allah is mentioning small sadaqah and big sadaqah in this ayah. Small sadaqah and big sadaqah. And when you think of sadaqah in their infaq, don't just think of money. I mean, when they were going out, they were giving up a year's salary, it was money, but they were also risking their lives. And you know, think about this. What are they going to give for the sake of Allah to prepare against the, Ro the mighty Roman army? The mighty Roman army. What are they going to give? Are they going to give a date? Are they going to give a, a sword, a horse? How is that going to make any difference? And so, so Allah begins with صغيرة. They will not give the smallest bit of sadaqah. And you know, when you say infaq, the master, the infinitive expected is infaq. وَلَا يُنْفِقُونَ إِنْفَاقًا صَغِيرًا But Allah says نَفَقَةً صَغِيرًا This is in Arabic what's called a Mastar Marra. What that means in simple English for the rest of you is a single act of charity. A single expense. In other words, they're so poor, they can't even spend more than once. Once they give, they look back in the bank, there's nothing left. <laughs> and even that is small. The one thing they could give is small. And even if it was big. Even if it was big. Now from our calculations, it won't make any difference. But what does Allah say? And it's not, there's not a single valley that they are going to cross. There's not a step that they're going to take. Like in the previous ayah, He says, They're not going to trample their feet. You know when you get really tired, your foot gets heavy? So you're, when, you, when you step on the ground, it gets heavier, your steps, right? It's an expression of exhaustion. Allah says when they're walking, when you're walking earlier, when you start your walk, your feet are light. You move quickly. As you get heavier, your steps get slower. This is called wata in Arabic. To trample. To, to really have heavy feet, which means you're exhausted. Allah says even in the previous ayah, every single step that they take. Now He says every single valley that they cross. إِلَّا كُتِبَ لَهُمْ It was reported for them. 
Allah is rewarding them for it. Allah is paying them for it. They're not moving towards the Roman army because they're going to defeat the Roman army. They're moving towards the Roman army because قَالَ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمْ سَمِعْنَا وَأَطَعْنَا We hear and we obey. And when they do that, Allah says, I will pay you. I will pay you, but I will pay you for that little thing you gave and the big thing you gave and every step that you took and every valley that you passed by. And today, of course, in Texas, we don't have no valleys, right? Flat land. So every, every mile marker you pass, every building you pass, every exit you pass is being reported by Allah. Every step you take for the sake of Allah, illa kutiba lahum. There's not one you've taken that hasn't been recorded. What does this do? What does that do to the Muslim? What we do for the sake of Allah is being reported by Allah. Why? لِيَجْزِيَهُمْ So that He could pay them. لِيَجْزِيَهُمْ اللَّهُ أَحْسَنَ مَا كَانُوا يَعْمَلُونَ So He can pay them with the best of what they used to do. SubhanAllah, what a beautiful ayah. You know when we do something for the sake of Allah, something we, sometimes we do really well and sometimes it's not so good. Sometimes your salat is really good, sometimes it wasn't so good. Sometimes you made a really good wudu, sometimes you didn't make a good wudu, you have good days and bad days. Allah says, when you do this for me, in front of odds that are impossible, when you see that, no, well, how can my little effort make any difference? But you don't care, because you're doing it for Allah. That's all you're doing it for. Then Allah will take the best of what you did and reward you based on the best of what you did. I want you to understand what that means. You know, there, again, there are students in, listening to the khutbah. You have, you know, you're, you're, you're doing math this semester or this quarter and you have five exams. One exam you got 100, all the other exams you failed. You all know that student will not pass that grade. If they got 100 on one exam and they failed all the other exams. It's not good, not enough to pass. Allah is saying, if you did one with a hundred and everything else was 20, 10, 15, He's not going to average all of it. He'll take the one you got for a hundred and base all of your reward based on the hundred. Allah. He'll count the best thing you did and He'll base the rewards on that. For people who have hopes with Allah, who are optimistic with Allah. And then victory comes. People that have that kind of trust in Allah pass the test. They understand that there are two worlds. The world they can see and the world they cannot see. The help and the calculations they can make and the calculations they cannot make. In Allah yasuku man yasha bi ghayri hisab. I'm sharing this khutbah with you because very recently, alhamdulillah, actually yesterday I came back from a long bit of travel. I had the opportunity to visit uh, uh, three countries and meet some Muslim communities in Malaysia and Singapore and Bahrain. And as I met these communities, subhanAllah, I was shocked. I, I'm really I'm still in shock at something about the United States, not even about them. I go there and they say, how's Imam Yasser Birjas doing? He's in Dallas, right? And what about Sheikh Abdul Nasser and the Qalam Institute? And how are your dream students doing? They're starting on the 15th. And random people, they know everything that's going on with us over here. Everything. All of our du'a, Imam Siraj, how's Imam Siraj doing? How's Sheikh Hamza Yusuf doing? How's the, uh, Dr. Yasser He's in Memphis, Tennessee, isn't it? Do you get a chance to meet him much? Because we follow him a lot over here. SubhanAllah, young people, old people. <laughs> We, we just think we're going to do a dust here, a lecture here, teach a class here, make a small effort here, just put it up on YouTube, leave it, leave an MP3 download or something. And SubhanAllah, it's nothing for us, not, it's a small effort, it's not even an effort. And when Allah wants to put barakah in it, when Allah wants, there's people on the other side of the planet, I mean you can't have more time difference between us and the Malaysians, it's 12 hours. They're on the other side of the planet. And they're following our work. And they're, they're, they're benefiting from the da'wah efforts of those that are putting the work in. You know what that gives you? It gives you hope. It gives you hope that no effort that the Muslim makes is worthless. No effort he makes or she makes, Allah will just let it go. Not in the akhirah, not even in this dunya. Not one step that we take. So we shouldn't underestimate the efforts that we have. We should not overwhelm ourselves with problems. Oh, there's so many problems. The ummah is just... You know, so many reasons to be depressed, but there are so many reasons to be ha happy. So many reasons to be optimistic. So many reasons to move forward. So many reasons to feel like, Ya Allah, I am ready to do work, put me to work. And I'm telling you, we are privileged, we're privileged to live in the kind of luxury and the kind of opportunity, uh, educational opportunities, career opportunities, living opportunities, financial opportunities that, that we do. 
We are privileged by Allah. And when we have that kind of privilege, we better put that to service for his deen. You know, we better do something for this deen. We shouldn't just live for ourselves. We should live for this deen. And you, you all have to think about that. It's not just activists and volunteers at the masjids and the dua and the khatib and the volunteers. Those are the people that do something for Allah. The rest of us just come and pray. Actually, Allah, because you signed up with la ilaha illallah, Allah expects more from each of you. He doesn't just want you to live for yourself. He wants you to live for this deen too. He wants you to do something for it. He wants you to be a contributor. Yeah. And I pray that Allah Azza wa truly make all of us contributors. That are, that are constantly thinking about how they can do, how they can build their home for Allah, for, you know, their home with Allah Azza wa for themselves and their families. I pray that this Ummah and its challenges are lifted, and I pray that Allah Azza wa makes us of those, puts barakah in the efforts, that, all the efforts that we're doing, that He puts barakah in them, that good comes for the Ummah and for the world through it. May Allah Azza wa accept our efforts and overlook the mistakes that we have in the things that we do. Barakallahu li wa lakum fil Qur'an al Hakim wa nafa'ani wa iyaakum bil ayati wa dhikr al Hakim. Alhamdulillahi wa kafa. والصلاة والسلام على عباده الذين اصطفى خصوصا على أولهم وخاتم النبيين محمد الأمين وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين يقول الله عز وجل في كتابه الكريم بعد نقول أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم إن الله وملائكته يصلون على النبي يا أيها الذين آمنوا صلوا عليه وسلموا تسليما اللهم صل على محمد وعلى آل محمد كما صليت على إبراهيم وعلى آل إبراهيم في العالمين إنك حميد مجيد اللهم بارك على محمد وعلى آل محمد كما باركت على إبراهيم وعلى آل إبراهيم في العالمين إنك حميد مجيد عباد الله رحمكم الله اتقوا الله إن الله يأمر بالعدل والإحسان وإيتاء ذي القربة وينهى عن الفحشاء والمنكر ولا ذكر الله أكبر والله يعلم ما تصنعون أقم الصلاة إن الصلاة كانت على المؤمنين كتابا منقوطا